Oh, I Can everyone hear me? Okay, hello, happy Saturday. And um, it's so nice to see you all in this in-person uh, in this in-person event, which is not at all strange after two years of Zoom events, almost two years of Zoom events. Um, thank you uh, to Marcel and to Casey, who is listening in somewhere, I think, and uh, to the Mexican Cultural Institute. I'm so happy that this first public event for me that I'm doing is here because this is such a, has been such a home for, for me as a historian of Mexico in Washington, DC, and what a wonderful, luxurious home it is. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's just wonderful to be here and to see people and to have this opportunity to um, learn about Mexico and think about Mexico and uh, talk about Mexican independence specifically. So, um, this event is called Independence in U.S. and Mexican Historical Memory, and we'll be having um, a conversation and then a conversation between the uh, panelists, and then after we'll have an audience conversation. So I do hope you will sort of collect your questions in your mind as we're talking, and then we'll hope to very much involve the audience in a discussion. And then this will be followed by a performance from Corazón Folklorico, which is very exciting. Um, I think it will be over there. And so we have a really nice program today. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I maybe should have done that first, but I'm Dr. Julia Young. I'm a, a associate professor of history at the Catholic University of America, which is just a little way close, very close to here, up the road, I think that way. And um, I uh, write and research and study um, the history of Mexico, Mexican migration to the U.S., and the Catholic Church. I'm very interested in the ways that um, Mexican Catholics who came from Mexico to the U.S. remained involved in religious, um, in politics, and especially in religious movements from uh, their new homes in the United States. Um, and so, uh, and so that's that's what I work on. I also teach classes on just in general Latin American history and migration history. And I'm very, very interested in, um, in Latin American lives on both sides of the, of the border. Um, and then here, to, I'd like to also present uh, Dr. Manuel Cuellar. He is assistant professor of Spanish literature at George Washington University in another direction down the road. And his research focuses on Mexican literary and cultural studies with an emphasis on race, gender, and sexuality. In particular, it engages questions of performance, especially as they concern dance, indigeneity, and negritud in Mexico, combining ethnographic fieldwork, archival research, and studies of contemporary and classical Nahuatl, Mexico's most widely spoken and written indigenous language. And for over 20 years, I. This, I had to pull this from the biography. Dr. Cuellar has been a practitioner of Mexican folklorico dance as an instructor and performer, and he's currently part of DC's Corazón Folklorico Dance Company. 
And um, we are also having a little bit of technical issues. We hope very much that we will be joined by a second panelist, uh, Mauricio, Dr. Mauricio Tenorio. He is the Samuel N. Harper Professor of History, Romance Languages and Literatures at the College at the University of Chicago. Um, and I, I received my graduate degree from there, so I knew him then. Um, Mauricio Tenorio's work focuses on the cultural and social history of Mexican urbanism, particularly of Mexico City. He has many books. One recent one is called I Speak of the City. It connects the realms of literature, architecture, music, popular language, art, and public health to investigate the city in a variety of contexts as a living history textbook, as an expression of the state, as a modernist capital, as a laboratory, and as language. So um, if we hope that he'll be able to join us, if not, we will talk about him and his work and we will invoke him. So <laughs> he'll be present in some capacity. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I have, as the moderator, I worked with um, both Manuel and Mauricio to develop some questions, which are really meant as, um, as jumping off points for discussion about Mexican independence and about the ways that um, that it has been celebrated historically and then the ways that it's been memorialized and remembered on both sides of the border. So both how have Mexicans celebrated and remembered their independence in Mexico? How have Mexicans in the United States celebrated and remembered their independence? Hi, Mauricio. You can see us and hear us. Wonderful. Yeah. Welcome. I just introduced you, but so here is Mauricio and this is fantastic that we now are technologically connected through and we're going to have a hybrid panel in uh, celebration of our new reality uh, in of hybrid life. Um, so it, what was I saying? So, um, so we're looking at both, we're thinking about both the ways that Mexicans themselves have celebrated and remembered independence in Mexico, the ways that Mexican migrants have celebrated and remembered independence in the United States, and then also the way that Mexican independence is remembered in the United States by people who might not be Mexican or might not have a connection to Mexico, how it's remembered and misremembered. So I'll start with my first question, which is, this year, Mexico celebrates the 200 year anniversary of achieving independence from Spain on September 27, 1821. Yet Mexico celebrates its Independence Day on September 16th. So every year, September 16th is the National Dia de Independencia. So could you, dear panelists, please help us understand the difference between these two dates and tell us why September 16th has emerged as the more important date versus September 27th. And Manuel is here and whoever would like to take the question first can. I could go first. Okay. Well, Mauricio, um, I just wanna thank the Mexican Culture Institute, Johns Hopkins University, Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas de la UNAM, and of course, Marcel and Casey for inviting me to participate today. Um, I'll start the, I'll start us with an answer about sort of like a timeline of the different celebrations and how it has evolved. And then Mauricio could perhaps elaborate after that. So one of the first records that we have of Mexican independence um, was by Hidalgo himself when he was tried in my home state, Chihuahua in 1811, he was asked how you know, the, the cry, el grito, the independencia came about and obviously um, made reference to Ignacio Allende and Juan de Dama and how they decided to do it on the early in the morning of September 16. Two years later in 1813, uh, Jose Maria uh, Morelos y Pavón writing Sentimientos de la Nación, which is a foundational document for Mexican history and independence. He stated that, uh, September 16th should be celebrated and commemorated as part of the, you know, the, the start of Mexican independence. Fast forward to 1821, once the independence was declared, um, and we see the army of the three guarantees, El Ejército Trigarante, and obviously an important figure, Iturbide, uh, decided to celebrate instead, I mean, they prioritized the, the end of the independence, right? 
it also coincided with his birthday, September 27. So that, that also helped that uh, he deprioritized uh, September 16. Um, but then we have a period of, you know, a lot of changes in Mexico. And there was the creation of Juntas Patrióticas, um, which were like these civic committees that were established. And they lasted three decades from 1825 to 1855. And the role of Junta de Patrióticas was precisely to celebrate September 16. And at first they didn't celebrate uh, the, the 27th, the end of the uh, independence, la consumación. It was until 1837, so it took them over 10 years to start celebrating and commemorating um, the end of independence. Um, and this helped to sort of differentiate between religious celebrations, which were very popular in Mexico, and start sort of helping the, the new citizens of this new nation that was first an empire, as it was discussed in the previous um, in days, um, to secularize the festivities, to sort of reduce the power of the church. And then, of course, we have the French intervention, right? And to the surprise of Mexican conservatives, Maximiliano decided to celebrate the 16th instead of the 27th. And of course, then, you know, came uh, the government of Porfirio Diaz. And a lot of the things that, a lot of the sort of rituals that we think of and we associate uh, with Mexican independence, such as the ringing of the bell, el grito at the Zócalo, were because of Diaz government. So in 1887, Diaz decided to transfer El Grito, which would take place indoors at El Teatro Nacional de Santana, uh, to El Zócalo. And that was very important. Imagine the, the summoning power, if you will, of doing the Grito, of celebrating the El Grito at the Zócalo with all the different sort of meanings the Zócalo evokes, right? From the, from the Mexica, Tenochtitlan, to obviously, um, you know, the colonial times. And then in 1896, that's when they brought the bell from um, Guanajuato, from Dolores, mm -hmm. right? And I think the celebrations have remained pretty much the same since 1896. You know, the ringing of the bell, El Grito, which as was, you know, Erika mentioned yesterday, we don't really know <laughs> exactly what was said. Uh, we don't even know whether the bell was rang uh, for sure, but it became part of the, of the history. And then obviously, uh, during the Mexican Revolution, the, you know, there was not a massive celebration until 1921, during the government of Obregón. And obviously, uh, he wanted to differentiate himself and his government from, from the Diaz government and decided to instead emphasize the celebrations of the end of independence. Uh, in 1921, which I'll be discussing a little bit more about later on. But yes, so one, you know, one funny fact also, it did help that Porfirio Diaz during that period of relative stability, I mean, his birthday was also September 15. Obviously, he will emphasize, you know, the celebrations on the, on the, of the, of the 16, starting on the 15th. So it's really all about the birthdays. It's all about saying. the birthdays, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just it is interesting, and I heard this come up in an, in another um, in the in the first panel that uh, it's an interesting contrast with the United States, where there's so, sort of this, I think, agreement on July fourth, seventeen seventy six, as the day, and not necessarily the understanding or the uh, recognition that independence is a process, and so this this debate over dates is partly about that process, the beginning of independence versus the end of independence. Mauricio, would you like to add anything? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, first, uh, um, between 1810 uh, and 80, um, before uh, 1821, uh, Lopez Rayón and others, when decided to establish the, the, to celebrate an honor Hidalgo and the revolt of 1810, was part of the revolt, not, was not yet a, a real date. 
But it's very interesting how after 1830 and up till the middle of the 19th century, uh, uh, these civic organizations pushed the celebration and gradually um, this, this public organization where, uh, where um, um, the members were the principales of the whole thing, liberals and conservatives. Uh, and so uh, it became civic, but over uh, before uh, the 1850s, before the 1860s, uh, both dates were celebrated, more one, more the other, depending on the moment. Uh, but uh, gradually more the 17, but, um, and then uh, with the triumph of the liberals, uh, 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 the celebration became more September 16 and more September 16. Uh, uh, which then Porfirio Diaz consolidated, and then ever since we have been celebrated this. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, I always believe that each country has the 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 the, um, the holidays it deserves, uh, and it is funny how it's not only that. Uh, uh, Julia mentioned July 4th, uh, uh, July 4th, it's July 4th and it's July 14th. Uh, after the 1830s, the Juntas Patrióticas are not only thinking of whether it's 16 or, or 27, is that Mexico has to have a date as July the 4th or as July the 14th at the French Revolution. It became very important for them to be able now the new uh, um, the new format of a nation includes that you have to have a national anthem, a, 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 a national day. And, and that was the weight of July 4th and July 14th uh, that were becoming very, very important years. Now, but I say everybody has the, the, the year you select because it's funny. In this kind of selection, whatever you win, you also lose. What is the what is the the what is at stake in selecting one or the other? In in addition to the to the facts that Manuel mentioned, um, first is Alamán versus México a través de los siglos o México su evolución social. It's independence. It's not clear that 1810 we celebrate independence. It is not clear that Hidalgo revolted for independence. Uh, it is clear that he revolted for Fernando VII, and then you can talk about endlessly, but it's not really the beginning of any independence, versus uh, a, a, a real politic in which indeed it was about independence. So, or we are talking about um, a celebrating an utopia of freedom and a revenge of criollos against peninsulares against the pragmatism of signing pacts in order to become a real independent nation uh, uh, in both cases, we are signing uh, or we are celebrating Catholicism. That is uh, uh, more than the bell uh, and the grito, which we will never know whether it really worked. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe was part of the revolt. And the Ejército de las Tres Garantías was about religion. Uh, and so in both, we celebrate that. But in a way, what we can say is that for a long time, uh, especially before the, uh, 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 the Porfiriato, where all this is uh, more or less settled with books like Mexico a través de los siglos or Mexico's Evolución Social, um, the idea was, uh, are we going to celebrate a massive revolt with the ghost and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the image of Guanajuato being looted and lots of Spaniards being killed and the image of Hidalgo that Alamán created as a crazy guy, which in, indeed he was, uh, a, a corrupt uh, priest, which indeed he was, uh, a sinful si uh, priest, who indeed he was, uh, uh, and a revolt that never was clearly going for independence, but was about a revolution or thing. Or are we going to celebrate a statehood moment in which our Washington, really Washington, which is Iturbide, as Washington, former member of his Majest majesty's armies, who packs with the last uh, uh, guerrilla guy who is alive because basically the revolt had been defeated. But the mess in Spain uh, makes that uh, Guerrero also pragmatically packs with the general in chief of the armies of the, of the, of the king uh, for independence. And so if you decide 16, we come from a porqueria. 
if you decide 27, we come for a porqueria. Is what kind of porqueria you want to come from? Uh, for the long time, for a long time, uh, Hidalgo has been, uh, despite the great, the great, the great first historian who really put all this thing together and actually was witness and put together all the documents was Alamán. And Alamán image of Hidalgo was terrible, but Mexico, a través de los siglos and Mexico's evolution social, with many, many historians, very important, Vicente Riva Palacio, Chavero, all these guys. Um, were consolidated in 16 and make it very uh, nice and, and um, a, a process of sanitation of the 16th of September as a good, uh, and then you have the image, oh, and we make it as a 4th of July, it has all the epic of all the great days, ta, 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 ta. but of course you are making lots of uh, tricks in the middle, a, a bell, there was no bell, uh, a, a grito, what, what was the grito, Fernando VII, uh, now, People celebrated the 27th and, and, and up to the Porfiriato in the centennial when, when Porfirio Diaz uh, organized uh, um, a public contest for people from all over the country to send proposals on how to celebrate. There were many to celebrate Iturbide uh, because he was the actual, uh, he is the father of the nation. Um, and at that time, uh, as Madero will put it, or as many will put it, uh, uh, it was now the, the, the parallel with July the 4th, July 17, and then it was 1822 in Brazil, because what, uh, what Iturbide was trying to do was what Brazil did, uh, which was to save the structures of the state uh, and become an empire without destroying the state in order not to go to chaos and everything. Well, as we know, in Brazil it worked and it, it had the more uh, relatively stable 19th century in Mexico and the rest of the countries, including the United States, it didn't work. And you have to go to many wars in order to consolidate the state. So uh, uh, we celebrate the 16 because the liberals decided that it was the good one and Iturbide is still the bad guy together with Porfirio Diaz and Santana. And, uh, Maybe we deserve our 16. Of course, we have to uh, clean it and everything. It will be kind of uh, fair no? to celebrate uh, the entrance of an army of religion, unity, and everything, and the independence of Mexico as an empire, uh, uh, who was, first of all, asking for a Bourbon uh, uh, prince to come and rule Mexico and become a commonwealth. And when the Spaniards didn't say, well, Don Agustin de Turbide is good enough. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a kind of bad beginning. Not that the other one is any good. <laughs> okay, so too, it's, it's, it is so interesting in what you're, there's so much to pick up on. Two things I'd like to say is that, you know, if we, if we think of this very, very simply, it's striking me that September 16th is the independence of the popular revolt and popular religion, right? The sort of uncontrollable religion from below, Hidalgo, the priest, right? And then September 27th, 1821 is the, is the celebration of really institutional, is the institutional celebration, the institutional revolt and institution, institutional religion. But since liberals um, favored September 16th, that had to be, as you say, Mauricio, sanitized um, and turned into an acceptable, a more institutionalized celebration. So that it's it's very interesting. And then I just I'm going to step a little bit on another question that I have, but I just want everyone to know, if you don't already, that or to think about who's on the walls in the Mexican Cultural Institute, which heroes are painted on the walls and whether um, Iturbide is on the walls. <laughs> you can guess whether he's here or not. Maybe someone can find him, but uh, who is memorialized even in this building is um, a very interesting question. So on to the next question, which is more about um, the shape of the celebrations that, um, the way the celebrations of independence took shape. So I'd like to know over the past 200 years, how have Mexicans celebrated independence? And Bill talked a little bit about this, um, but really like what, what have those celebrations looked like? Um, 
have they been the same from 200 years ago to now, or have they changed over time? Um, I'm, I'm rolling several questions into this. It's really, what do the celebrations look like? But have there been ways that different groups, even whether within Mexico or within and outside of Mexico have celebrated independence? And then in particular, I would like to hear about the role of dance and music. So, so Manuel, if you wanna start with this question and then we'll loop in Mauricio. Yes. Um... Well, the celebration has been evolving, and as Mauricio just mentioned, the emphasis has shifted. And you will get this, you, you will see this in the oradores, right? Sort of praising the nation, lauding Hidalgo, or trashing him, praising the Spaniards, or trashing them, or the indigenous people. Um, there's always been music and dance, and drinking, of course. And, um, so much so that at times, you know, those activities wanted to be police. The fact that the celebrations start on the on the 15th in the evening also <laughs> lend themselves very easily to this. I but I wanted to focus on two what I think are foundational moments uh, for the celebrations of Mexican independence. And the first one is uh, the centennial celebrations um, organized by the Diaz regime, right? Uh, obviously, Diaz wanted to celebrate Mexican independence as the French did with the World's Fair or, you know, or the United States. Um, they didn't do a World's Fair, but they definitely organized a very pompous um, celebration uh, with a lot of activities. And I wanted to share with you um, a couple of images from, from them that I had prepared. And the other one being obviously 1921, the first celebration after the Mexican Revolution uh, during the post-revolution uh, organized by the Obregón government. Um, can you help me please project the images? So part of the, part of the reason what I'm thinking about these two moments of, as very foundational is because of the emphasis of engaging the masses in a very different scale and in a way teaching the public, sort of interpolating Mexican citizens to identify with the nation. It was a pedagogical practice of sorts. So there were obviously bailes, all these balls, um, as you can see in the images organizing, you know, reflecting very much like cosmopolitan trends of the time, imitating Europe. Uh, the Diaz regime was um, a Francophile regime, right? We looked up to, to France all the time and it congregated people. Um, another thing that they wanted to showcase was the abandonments of, the, of Mexico, the city, including, um, you know, the lighting. This was, a, imagine, if this was a sensation and uh, there, there was, you know, lighting, public lighting. Um, the Diaz regime organized various activities, and I wanted to focus on two that um, Mauricio has also written extensively on. But let me just tell you, for instance, the Diaz regime organized a garden party, and they call it like that, El, the gar El Garden Party in Chapultepec. And apparently 50,000 people attended, right? So this is a lot of people for the time. And they also organized this which was El Desfile Historico, this historical parade. And I, and I know this is not dance per se, but this is definitely a public lesson of, you know, not, but in a way it was a way of, to choreograph the nation. It was a public lesson uh, on performance um, because the history, Mexican history was literally paraded. It was performed. It was embodied. And some chronicles say that around um, close to 3,000 people participated in the parade, like 2,800. I mean, I mean, numbers change a lot. And thousands and thousands of people attended the parade. And it had, you know, they emphasized three key moments. And I think this is why I wanted to start here, because they started with the meeting between Moctezuma and Cortes at the Zócalo. So we here see. Uh, you know, the group of, uh, we see there Moctezuma on a palanquin, and then we see indigenous people carrying him. And then we see, uh, as part of the desfile, we see that image uh, showing Hidalgo, and you could see how 
uh, the masses mixed with the parade. This was just, it became like a mob. I saw some, some chronicles described as such. Um, one of the things that I wanted to sort of uh, emphasize is how bodies in movement mobilize the past. And this is something as a performance studies scholar I'm obsessed with, right? Because it was this, yes, it was a vision organized by Delis. Jose Casarín organized, was in charge of organizing the parade. But I'm very interested how these performance interpolated others, the indigenous people that had been displaced, that had recently moved to the city, correct? And also the elites who were fascinated by their presence, right? There was an ordinance that wanted them to, wanted, they stipulated that campesinos and indigenous people shouldn't be wearing, you know, their clothing. They wanted them to look more presentable. Of course, it failed. Nobody followed that rule. But um, I wanted to share with you um, the contrast of this historical parade um, in 1910 sort of organizing an idea of what Mexico was, right? And with what happened in 1921, which became, which offered a more popular vision. And as you can see in these images, dance was very important. I mean, there were balls, the traditional ones, uh, reflecting, you know, cosmopolitan aesthetics and values, et cetera. But there were also, you know, for the first time, there were all these stages where you could see traditional dances, as you'll see later on today, performed by, you know, Corazón Folclorico, dances from, from the state of Jalisco, and dancing in Jarabe Tapatio, you could see the figures of La China Poblana, the Charros, uh, which were not by then sort of the metonym or the epitome of Mexican nationalism just yet. As you could see here on the, on the picture, we have Jaraneros, you know, dancers from Yucatan, the chronicles, people who write who wrote chronicles about these events didn't even know uh, what to call them. Sometimes they call them Mayas, you know, or, or just dancers from Yucatan, uh, or just simply Jaraneros, uh, because, you know, they, they, were, they didn't have the vocabulary. But you could see how these events, these dances took place, you know, in bull rings, in, in plazas de toros, right? And obviously there was also a parade. And you see the, there the image uh, of, Maria, um, Maria, um, the India Bonita, oh my gosh, I'm totally blanking on her name, Maria Viviana Uribe, who was elected as literally the embodiment of the new Mexicanidad, of the new image of the Mexicanidad. We see um, how indigeneity became aestheticized and literally represented the nation. And one of the other things that I wanted to share with you, and this is something that I'm, you know, I write about in my, in my book, it's La Noche Mexicana. This for me was a foundational event, a turning point of sorts as a dancer, of course, because Mexico was literally put on stages. Instead of organizing the garden party, um, Adolfo Vez Maugar was hired not three years late, not three years before, like the Diaz government organized the committee, but the month before, you know, the Diaz government organized a committee in, in, in 1907. The post revolutionary governments didn't have the means or resources. They hired the one in charge of organizing La Noche Mexicana, this Mexican night, the month before. And he decided to go with, instead of organizing a garden party, he decided to organize a feria. So there were, imagine Chapultepec right? The, Chapultepec is a scenario of sorts. I mean, obviously, it was very important during the French intervention, Los Niños Heroes, how all these narratives and rituals associated with it. But there were several stages organized throughout the events, um, throughout the, the park. And then you will see the Jaraneros, you will see the Jackie Indians, you will see the Juanas, you will see Chinas and Charros dancing, obviously the display of fireworks. There was a replica of the Popocatépetl, right? And then you could see the Popocatépetl back then. Um, and so this was really a traditional feria. And then the organizers invited Las Hermosas Señoritas to be donning um, or wearing the Juana outfits and, and, and China Poblana. And music was also very important. La Orquesta del Centenario with 350 members play at this Noche Mexicana. And something that was really emphasized by the organizers, organizers is that this was, all the performances were authentically Mexican. 
and it was very important for them. It was changing the discourse. And so you could see the stage here of the Jaraneros, how just people just gather around the, the, the stage, right? Because they were, they were in awe. Remember, like the revolution led people to the streets, but they didn't know the nation yet. And so the nation was put on display, literally on stage, and it was performed. And, and I think what's very interesting is what, it's something that we need to think about is what regions were sort of um, privileged. There's no coincidence that they invited the Jackie, Jackie dancers, Pascola dancers, right? I mean, after all, Obregón from Sonora had won, was one of the, the, you know, was part of the, yeah, the group that won. And then we have the sort of obsession with the Tehuana, which is not a surprise um, either. Um, but notice the absence of Veracruz, for instance, right? That now is also very important for, the, for our times. And so here you see images from periodicals from the, from the time. This is from El Universal Ilustrado. Uh, when you see, you know, how the stage, how, you know, like the central stage in the middle of the lake. Um, and then you see also, uh, the booth with Chinas Poblanas, the Jaraneros, and of course, to, to the image on, on my right, on, on your right too, you see the, the Pascola dancers. Manuel Palavicini writes like, they, they look like fakirs fakir, fakir from, from India, right? Because they didn't have the vocabulary yet, because they remain in the same position with the bodies a little bit bent over, repeating the same step, right? And so, this became um, a very important part of how we think of the celebration of Mexican independence nowadays, right? There's always folklorical dancers, there are always musicians. Um, it became so popular and had such a big impact that by 1925, at the border of Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, as my colleague Elaine Peña writes here, there was a Noche Mexicana, not for Mexican independence, but for the celebrations of George Washington's birthday. Um, and yes, they do have a replica, of, instead of Chapultepec, they have Xochimilco, and you know, they wanted to sort of replicate this event also to interpolate. So think about how, think about how images interpolate a public, but think about how bodies moving corporeally interpolate the audience, especially Mexico City audience that didn't know how, what Mexico was right at this time in 1921. If we've learned anything from this, you know, from COVID, it's like the importance of gathering, how meaning is created like this, how we learn to read body language. These dancers taught Mexicans, you know, how to move, how to perform gender, how to perform history. And I think this is something that uh, has become part of like a staple of Mexican imaginaries. When we think about this festive Mexico, this is what we think about. And this is something that I wanted to share with you um, uh, today. And I do have some, um, well, I'll leave it there and then I'll let my Okay, right. maybe we'll be able to come back to more images. Oh, well, let's back up. Let's back up if you wanna. Yes. And I just wanted to show this image very quickly. The last one. Oh, well, here you see like how it was massive. I mean, just very quickly, I wanted to say that the organizers were gonna charge five pesos and they were expecting around 30,000 people. So they only printed 15,000 the weekend before. They had to make the event free um, because 160,000 people had expressed interest. And the, the periodicals from the time say that between 250,000 and half a million, 500,000 people attended the event. It was massive. And another thing that I wanted to share here very quickly is to see the contrast between Maria Viviana Uribe, this indigenous woman, versus Una Hermosa Señorita, Ofelia Nieto, sort of wearing the dress of La Tehuana, right? And who gets to embody Mexico and what that means. Um, which is a debate that we still have. Think about Roma and Alicia Paricio. Same sort of yeah. questions come up. Thank you. I, I, I want to jump in quickly and just say that um, from in the research that I was doing on Mexican independence celebrations in the United States in the 1920s, they looked a lot like that. There would always be a 
well, I don't know about always, but the ones I saw, there would be a queen that was elected, right? So there's a sort of female figure and often parades and often some kind of um, representative parade, like sort of a parade with representatives from different regions of Mexico and dance. So it is interesting that it, but by the time we get to the 1920s, we have real um, uh, neighborhoods, communities of Mexicans developing in, in the United States. Obviously this is complicated, new, relatively recent migrants. And so I wonder if they are also I mean, they definitely are bringing this to the US and sort of replicating it in the US. And of course that's layered on top of the older communities of Mexican origin people in New Mexico or in Texas or California who have their own celebrations. So it's interesting to think about the ways that those celebrations get, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of um, conformed over to, or, or standardized over time, right? And, and I think actually this goes back to the first question that we, um, in the beginning of, in the time close to the actual event of independence, there are conflicting memories, there are competing narratives, there are just disagreements about which day should be celebrated. And as time goes on, those celebrations, well, we, eventually one date wins out, right? And those celebrations also become more standardized. But Mauricio, would you like to add anything to this particular question? Or I can also move on to the next one. But we'd love your thoughts and you know so much about this particular question. I would hate to not have well, you. Uh, how could I answer? First, uh... I don't, I'm not sure I agree with Manuel about the 1921 celebration because I think uh, you don't change what Tocqueville called the mores of the people in 11 years, especially if you consider that the, all the organizers of the 1921 were deep uh, culturally Porfirians. Uh, so, uh, I think that the 1921 celebration is not marked by being the celebration before the centennial celebration. That is, it's not a celebration after 1910. It's a celebration after 1914 and 1917, which is what makes them uh, different in a way. But I think that the celebration of 1921, which I have studied and written about it, is a profoundly Porfirian celebration, which uh, um, uh, which uh, repeats all the leitmotifs, even the same structures, the same bodies, the same things than the celebrations of the Porfirian times. The accents about this popular uh, uh, indigenous thing, uh, first, the, the India Bonita was a private contest. It was something organized by, by, by newspapers, not by the government. And, um, and the other, uh, uh, things are very Porfirian in this set. Let me put it this way uh, to do it very briefly. If we were talking about celebrations in the 1850s, what you will have is people in Mexico City celebrating in La Alameda with uh, 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 lots of fireworks. Fireworks is a very interesting thing. It's always there and it comes from very long tradition of fireworks. Then uh, uh, lots of, of poems and lots of uh, compositions. Um, we don't have military parades. And it's in La Alameda. Uh, then if you move from there, there to the Porfirian and the Centennial, well, I, I don't want to repeat the entire Centennial. I, uh, uh, you know how it was and, and, and the whole thing. But the interesting thing about this is that, um, uh, just to, to, to show the other thing, so we emphasize sort of fancy cocktails, there was a parade reestablishing the entire, uh, uh, reenacting the entire uh, national history in walking ways. There was a transformation of the Paseo de la Reforma. There was the Monument of Independence, which was a kind of summary of the entire history, including the Catholic views and everything. Though you have to hide the, the, the statue of uh, uh, Lampart inside because, uh, Although the radical liberals wanted to show this Lampard who was a crazy Irish who wanted independence in colonial times, but who was killed by the Inquisition. 
But then at the end, you know, the Catholics were happy if the if Lampard was inside uh, at the size of the ashes of the Hidalgo and the other guys. So uh, we all, or, or we, the, you know, the, Fra the French like things and, and uh, the big parade, but uh, what we don't realize is that the Porfirian, everything about this uh, celebration in 1921, um, uh, the music, for instance, in 1850, uh, uh, remember, there was no national anthem, anthem until the late 1850s, and it was a national anthem uh, produced by a Catalan who Santana brought to Mexico as a musician, uh, and it was a very, uh, the, the lyrics talk about Iturbidi had to be clean uh, in order to, to make it after a while. So the, the, the a national anthem started to be played, but then there was, there were many songs in the 60s and we're very much part of the celebration. One, the most famous one was La Paloma, uh, who any Mexican ought to know in the sort of uh, parody that many parodies that have been made because there, there was a liberal uh, Paloma, which was also sung in the celebrations as a, as a uh, the Paloma was very famous in, in, in Maximilian times, but then it was parade and it, uh, paro uh, there were many parodies of the same song. The song says, si a tu ventana llega una paloma, trátala con cariño que es mi persona. It's an habanera, uh, very Cuban, it's a, Cuban, a Spanish Cuban, uh, uh, but it was taught as Mexican. It was so famous that, uh, and sung uh, always in theaters and everything and in the celebrations, that even uh, in, the, in, in World War I, uh, uh, people sung it in the uh, Austro-Hungar Empire, as I have shown in other, in other places. Uh, even Proust talks about La Paloma. Um, now, but what we don't talk about the Porfiriato is that since the Porfiriato established that in the, uh, first, as, as Manuel said, they moved the celebration to El Zócalo, they moved the, the bell, they did the grito, they established a whole uh, ritual. But, the ritual included always points in what they call it lengua nacional. The national university had to have professors in lengua nacional. So unlike the post-revolutionary government, whenever we celebrate the, 70, the, the 16 with poems in Nahuatl, the Porfiriato always celebrated with uh, poems in lengua, in lengua nacional. Uh, there was always a professor of lengua nacional, and there was always celebration in Nahuatl. Moreover, all the different things that by the 1920s, uh, uh, Best Manguar and, and the, and the, and the uh, music were done by uh, Porfirian folklorists who were obsessed with rec rescuing all the traditions, all the different ways. Uh, they were the ones who in the cele centennial celebration inaugurated Teotihuacan, reinaugurated Teotihuacan, did all the archeological work they were the ones who were publishing in the Museo Nacional all the different local traditions and the songs that were being recuperated uh, all over the country that were uh, of a popular tradition. Uh, um, of course, in the 19, uh, the, the, and the Porfirians always included this, it was part of this. Now in the 2021, I think the accent on that is not because it's Porfirian, it's profoundly Porfirian, but it's more visible not that the, uh, the 1921 didn't have a French uh, bouquet and, and, and the elites of the Branis and the Panis and the rich people like in Porfirian times had the, the, same, the same script, exactly the same, but the accent was in this popular because it's after 1917, um, not because it's after 1910. And, uh, and the funny thing is that, that uh, uh, by the 1930s, especially after the Cardenismo, the, the sort of program is, is, is set and it's always the same. Military parades after the revolution are included and all the, up until very recently, if may I say so, uh, with all respect, with all due respect, uh, the parades were part of this, uh, both for a long time were uh, a kind of the revolutionary government strength and the whole nationalism, which is kind of liberalism, gentrified, porfirias, porfir national, uh, na porfiria nationalism, gentrified and reconstructed. For instance, you have to get rid of all the anti-clerical stuff, uh, which Porfirio Diaz was very good in doing that. Then the, the, the revolutionaries, uh, many celebrations were very anti-clerical. Uh, anti uh, but by the 40s, especially with uh, Cardenas, 
sort of become Porfirian in that way. We are Jacobines, but we don't say it. You just don't mention it. Don't mention God. Uh, uh, and that was the case until very recently, if I say so with all due respect, in our last celebration is the same old, uh, la misma gata pero revoltada, but uh, when, you, when we celebrated uh, parades when I was young, it was nice because you will go to Paseo de la Reforma a ver el ejército because you never saw the ejército. The, one of the great truths of the Mexican Revolution is to civilize the, the, the army. Uh, and one of the things is God was never mentioned. Uh, and the funny thing is we have the same Gata Pero Revolcada, but now to see the army parade in the streets of Mexico City in my own view, with all due respect, today is very different because the army is in charge of everything. The, char the army is in charge of the construction of all the major war with no contest whatsoever, with no competition whatsoever, with no accountability whatsoever. The army is in charge of all the airports. The army is in charge of everything. So now to see them parade, it's a very different thing. Uh, uh, second, God is everywhere. So it's the 17th, 16th of, of September with God back. So it's the same nationalism or revolutionary, but with God and the army. Okay. Um, well, I think again, that sort of, I think maybe the theme of this discussion is just the way that these celebrations change over time. And this is historical memory, right? We don't have a historical, it's historical memory isn't an event happens and then we have a memory of it and then that memory stays the same, right? It's, it's, it, 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 it changes and the way it changes is political and it's subject to political changes. Um, Mauricio, Mauricio's comment bringing in the revolution and I mean, I'm just going to be thinking about the walls of the Mexican Cultural Institute this entire time, but over there by the stairs, we have um, the, uh, we have, I think if I'm visualizing it correctly, we have um, Hidalgo along with Benito Juarez, along with someone from the revolution or else that's in the painting that's over there. But in any case, the incorporation of revolutionary heroes into alongside or next to independence heroes is, is very interesting because of course these are two such separate events and yet we also have 1810 and 1910 and that nice, I don't know, things in Mexico seem that, 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 that nice circularity. Um, so I wanna go back to something and I think we have about 15 more minutes for us to talk before we open it up. So maybe I can ask, I have two more questions and maybe I can ask for fairly quick responses. I wanna go back to that issue because it's so fascinating to me of the Pantheon, right? Like who is celebrated? Um, and we've already talked a little bit about why certain figures may have were sidelined or forgotten or sanitized right and so we have our like when we think of the men that emerged as heroes or protagonists of independence we have Hidalgo and Morelos and and then and Guerrero and then Iturbide but he's kind of you know again it's not on the walls <laughs> right okay I gave it away I said to look and he's not on the wall so but anyway with that story we've talked about it a little bit already and we could keep talking about it, but I wanna talk about someone else who's not on the walls at all, which is the female, the women who were involved in independence and they were there, right? And, and what Manuel, what you were talking about before with the parades made me realize, oh, the women are there, but they've all been blurred into this generic, the la reina de la fiesta, right? Like the queen of the, of the or of the parade. Um, and that's the female, and maybe the dancers and the and the you know the, the regional dancers, but those are the women that are memorialized, and they're not a, they're not actually anyone. There, that's a generic figure. So, is that changing in Mexico? Is there more of an attempt to? I mean, is there more of an attempt to um, to identify the women that are there? Are women right who were involved? And so, is there more of an attempt to identify them to highlight them? Are they being brought back in the historical memory? And I guess this is a really big question and it's hard to answer uh, quickly, but also, you know, like, I mean, I have this question in, in, as a historian in life in general, like why were the women 
sidelined? Why were they forgotten? Why are they not on the walls here? And why are they not on the walls anywhere? You know, <clears throat> so very quickly, <laughs> you know, answer how, however you like. Should I? Please, please do. Very rapidly, it's funny, um, Julia, um, um, it is not very hard to understand why women were not included in many celebrations, in any celebration of the world uh, for a long time. But it's funny that you mention it because in the kind of obsession with the 21 termination in Mexico, all the terminations of Mexico, the Bay Ferry, there is always a woman. Uh, in the conquest, you know, had very few singular uh, characters, Moctezuma, Cortes, and La Malinche. Mm -hmm. So there is a woman, uh, it's, which has been endlessly debated in American history, vilify and now uh, gentrify and everything, but it's not that there was not a woman. Uh, it was a woman as important or even more than Moctezuma and a woman as important uh, as uh, Cortes. Uh, so there was a woman, but of course there was, it's not that, that there was an attempt to, to include them. Um, see the debates in the new, um, uh, in the debates about the Columbus monument, they are going to substitute it because now we are concerned with this, with, a, with an abstract concept, the indigenous woman. Not even Malinche, why? Because if you put Malinche, war stars, because Malinche is a very contested, uh, but it's a woman, and a very important woman, a very smart woman, a very significant, I mean, the conquest would have not been the same without the Malinche. Now, from the beginning, there is a woman in the pantheon of heroes in 1829, La Corregidora, yeah. who is uh, all it was when I was, a, when, I was a, when I was young many years ago. La Corregidora was in the coins, uh, um, and so there was also a woman. And in the revolution, the image of the soldadera had was also consolidated in the popular culture, in the singings, in the thing. So not that people care about it, not that really it was really important, but as it happens, as it just happens as a coincidence, without even in. Uh, the, the sort of the cultural institutions without even trying to emphasize this, they were there. Uh, now, in the last years, uh, it has been a, a great effort to include them, and more and more it's being discussed, but, uh, um, but during the good priesta years of uh, the creation of the welfare state, um, women were all, uh, were very important. Remember, for instance, El, El, El Monumento a la Madre, which is a bit like the monument to the indigenous woman, uh, the monument to la madre is sort of moral concept, you know, oh, for, for la que nos quiso antes de conocernos. Okay, uh, so what are you going to say? No, we don't want a monument for the, for, for uh, las mamás son malas. Uh, no, of course, it's a moral concept, it's fine. But there was a lot of, uh, especially in the few big institutions, think of the Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, I was always surprised both as a, as a historian and as a patient of the Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, all the representations of women everywhere, the importance of the, of the, of the image of the, of the uh, um, enfermera del Instituto Mexicano del Solda, the, the, and the very, the very symbol of the Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, which is a, a kind of a, a women uh, called by a, a, an eagle, and, uh, and a woman who is taking care of a baby uh, mm -hmm. and, and the murals and everything. So uh, uh, it used it a lot, the revolutionary government, the revolutionary, the nationalismo revolucionario used a lot the image of the women for the creation of the welfare state. But there was no future for until the last uh, two decades or three decades to try to look more for the role of women in this. And of course, many things had been uh, found and many uh, new things, but. Um, yet uh, to this day, as the moment, as we are speaking, when they want to uh, change the story that Columbus means in the uh, Paseo de la Reforma, instead of, a bo uh, of a talking of a concrete historical woman, they talk of the idea of indigenous women, 
in general. Right. I mean, I, that's just what I would just say, you know, okay, La Malinche, that, that is a name that's, a, that's taken from her actual name, but all of these women that have come up, like La Malinche, La Corregidora, La Soldadera, like it's a kind of er woman, like a kind of, what's the word? I'm like a not, there's an anonymity to it. It's not her yeah. first name and her last name. And she's not on the walls. <laughs> None of these women are on the walls and they're not, you know, you don't, they're, you might see statues of them. Of course, you could go to the Palacio Nacional and you could see the pictures of La Malinche, right? And, and women are portrayed a lot, but there is this sort of, um, yeah, there, there, it does seem that there's more work to be done to actually right, give them names and bring them back in. And this is not a, this is not just a problem in Mexico. This is also a problem in historical memory, right? How do women get excluded from historical memory and from the historical pantheon? I don't have the answer. I don't think we have to, we'll have to work on that for several years, <laughs> at least. Did you want to add to that? Yes, and just very quickly, I think one of the things that it was discussed yesterday uh, between Caitlin and, and Erica is how to think of actors, right? We never think of these women who fought, who helped, you know, who worked as nurses, et cetera, or conspiradoras um, as active actors, but rather we always think of them in, in terms of their social positioning and gender. So Jose Fortis, la esposa del corregidor, no? I mean, like the, the, that, that might be the exception, but I'm thinking of Leona Vicario, both Leona Vicario and Josefa Ortiz Dominguez were always, um, were actually celebrated during the centennial in 1910. But during the celebrations of 1921, I don't think there was anything um, particularly done to sort of um, commemorate the role of women. And I'm also thinking yesterday, Erika, for instance, mentioned um, La Huera. Rodriguez. Sí. Uh, you know, and the relationship with Victor Vida, for instance, you know, come to mind. So it's always like, oh, la mamá de los hermanos López Rayón, you know, the mother, the partner, the wife, uh, Leona Vicario and Quintana Roo. You, yeah. I think the this symbol. is something that we need. The, Absolutely. Yeah, the, the women become symbols and not, not individuals. Yes. So, okay, I have a last question. Um, and it's a, it, this is, I think, a sort of short question, but we have to ask it because we're in the United States and uh, the first time that I celebrate, I'm gonna confess something here, which is the first time that I celebrated, Mex celebrated Mexican independence was a Cinco de Mayo party, you know, in, in early college. Um, and then I went on to subsequently learn that that is not Mexican independence, but it's common misperception in the United States or, you know, there's, there's barely a perception of what it, what it is, right? But if you ask any, if you ask anyone at a Cinco de Mayo party what they're celebrating, if they have an answer, it's probably going to be like Mexican independence, yay, <laughs> right? So, so how did that happen? Why did Cinco de Mayo become um, the sort of shorthand for Mexican independence in the U.S.? Is it actually so? Because the flip side, I think, is that then people who know a little bit say, oh, Cinco de Mayo isn't a real holiday in Mexico. That's actually, you know, so they can you know, poke at the people who are having the parties and say, well, that's not a, even a thing. It's that's made a totally made up holiday by Budweiser or whoever wants to, or guacamole, the guacamole lobby. Or, <laughs> so, um, so what is Cinco de Mayo actually? And why do we think it's Mexican? Why do some people think it's Mexican independence in the United States? Do we know? <laughs> Mauricio, should I go? Uh, well, I have my theory, and, uh, but it's not, um, others have other theory. I think that the, the, the importance, uh, everything has to do with the American Civil War. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, Mexican communities uh, in, the, in the United States, not, we always think of migration, not, not migration. You right. know, remember, uh, uh, the most important ones in both in terms of numbers and in terms also of uh, the number of uh, literate people, uh, landowners, elites, was in the territory of New Mexico, who was granted uh, statehood very late, precisely because it was uh, Oklahoma was granted uh, statehood before New Mexico because because Mexico, uh, New Mexico was uh, full. Uh, I mean, had a lot of population, but it was Mexi Mexican speakers, Spanish speakers, and Mexicans, and and so. Um, but um, the fact that they were there 
and the fact uh, that uh, uh, the wars, uh, uh, the, the, the war against the Second Empire, Maximilian, the Austrian and the French troops took place simultaneously with the American Civil War. And the fact that New Mexico joined the Union, not only uh, to support, not, nothing to do with slavery, uh, there were fewer slaves in, 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 in New Mexico. They uh, joined the Union uh, uh, because uh, they hated the, the Texans who had done ills to them. And, and the Texans were Confederates, they were fighting for the Confederates. And so 4,000 Mexicans fought for the Union. And remember Juarez and Lincoln were uh, the only great allies, uh, not that they could help each other because both were in their respective wars, uh, but in a way they, they helped each other because the moment uh, Lincoln was able to, uh, uh, Ulysses Grant was able to win the war, then of course the French knew that they had to leave. Um, and so during those years, I, uh, the 5th of May became very important because it was a symbol both of their Americanness and their Mexicanness, and they celebrated. Not that they don't they don't celebrate the 16th of September. They celebrated 16th of September as they all did. They were good liberals, very Juaristas, very Lincoln, very Democrats, and and that consolidated the 5th of May as a very important day. For a long time, it was celebrated then in consulados. Also, Mexican consulates will celebrate the 16th of September, but then popular people will celebrate the 5th of May because remember this is. This is the moment of celebration of a moment in which not a war, because the war was lost, but a, a, a battle was won uh, by a, a Mexican army against a foreign army. And these are Mexicans who are celebrating their liberalism, their Juarez, their Lincoln, uh, their anti-Europeanism, their anti-imperialism uh, um, in the United States. It was clear for them that it was not independence. It was a very important date. And, but then after the 70s, with the civil rights and the Chicano movement and everything, well, Cinco de Mayo became like a, a you know, St. Patrick's Day and um, you know, Cinco de Mayo sale and uh, and uh, it just became part of the calendar of commercial stuff. Uh, and because nobody really cares, uh, it, it, so people thought that it was July the fourth for Mexico. No, it was not July the fourth. Is is uh, but September sixteen. Uh, in Chicago or uh, every that was celebrated too uh, as, September, as uh, 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 May 5th uh, was celebrated. But the, import, the original importance of the May, my impression is, uh, is because of the Mexico and the Civil War. However, some others agree, it, argue that it's about California. I don't know. Yes. And, um... Erika Panin actually started talking about this yesterday. Um, one of the historic, well, someone who's written about this extensively is uh, David Hayes Bautista, and he actually traces the, the history of Cinco de Mayo related to what Mauricio was just saying, sort of the celebration of freedom and democracy, all these liberal ideals, and how he traces how this celebration has historically changed as part of the historical memory. For instance, um, there were also juntas, Juntas Patrióticas would organize these festivities of Cinco de Mayo in California, Nevada, Oregon, and in a way to commemorate these ideals, right? Uh, but then they start losing their power. And then around 1910, uh, remember, this is a, a period of a lot of migration and changes in the Southwest, right? We have the gold rush too, and we have a lot of Central Americans, uh, South Americans arriving. And Around 1931, uh, there was a Comité Cívico Patriótico Mexicano, right after the, the revolution. Imagine all these waves of migrant change in the meaning of Cinco de Mayo from a Latino holiday, a Latino centric holiday, to a more Mexican centric holiday, right? The story of like David y Goliath in a way. But I think it's very important to, to consider how this holiday has had the power to interpolate Latinx communities and for them to, again, to sort of assert the presence as part of like active as actors of a particular community, right? And um, one of the things that we, I, I like to sort of point out is another change came about during the civil rights, as Mauricio said, because at, at least in the Southwest, it was an, a moment um, to showcase the values of the community, to organize the community. 
And some of that still, I think, can see some of the, some of those traces, like the celebrations in San Francisco, where you do have uh, the celebration of September 16, um, organized by the Mexican consulate. But the celebration of um, El Cinco de Mayo is a more popular celebration around Dolores Park or La Misión, and, and the scope changes. And certainly, we can think of three moments uh, when it became, you know, very commercialized. You know, the LA Broadway Fiesta, or the when the the postal service issued that that stamp with a folklorical with a folklorical couple, and when Bush invited. Uh, you know, celebrate the Cinco de Mayo and actually make connections to Lincoln, et cetera, right? So I think these are things that we need to consider um, about how the Cinco de Mayo has evolved until it became this sort of Cinco de Drinco sort of thing and as reminding them like, no, it is no Mexican independence. And yes, but I myself experienced that transformation. It's like, why is this celebrated until I understood the dynamics of what it meant for the local Latino community, right? As a folklorical dancer, obviously, mm -hmm. participating in these events both in the Cinco de Mayo celebrations and the Mexican um, independent celebrations. It's gonna be really interesting to think, to see, I just made me think about what if, I mean, now we have Hispanic Heritage Month yes. in the US, right? And that's, I don't actually know how old that is, but that's sort of be turning into also this sort of generic month long celebration of, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's, sometimes people know about the independence movement because it goes to September 15th to, October 16th or something like that. So it encompasses a whole bunch of independence dates actually in different countries. Um, so I wonder if that might like pull the celebrate the center of gravity <laughs> back into September. Who knows? But that's yet another thing about the uh, historical memory and which holidays are celebrated and why and where, right? And you, and as somebody that lived in both Mexico and the United States, you experienced that, that shifting of holidays too, right? Um, and I and I, I just I'm going to point to the walls one more time out there. Make sure you go and see the handshake between the way that the art the um, muralist depicted the U.S. Uh, Mexico collaboration is that handshake, where there's a hand between the two um, between Mexico and the United States, and then you see the head of Lincoln and the head of Juarez on either side of the handshake. So, just to remember that it's it's all on the walls. Basically, everything we've talked about is on the walls here. <laughs> So could we uh, thank you so much, Manuel and Mauricio, for your answers. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'd love to, in the time we have left, about, 10, okay, so 10, 15 minutes or so, if we could, um, if people have questions, thoughts, uh, please, for, for our panelists, please share them. Oh, sorry, you're right. That's right. That's right. The handshake is with uh, is includes South America. That's right, and also Simon Bolivar is there. Yeah. So it's it's more encompassing than just Mexico and the U.S. Mike, do, and do you need people to step up to the mic or? Hello. Thank you so much for a fascinating dialogue. Um, I have a question for Dr. Cuellar and Tenorio about the um, Dia Centennial in 1910. And um, what was striking about the image you showed was, and then uh, Manuel, you mentioned the, the, the kind of uh, Francophone uh, fascination and the World's Fair fascination. I, I couldn't help but think about the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, and um, and in fact, um, I came across a, um, a a kind of like a tourist guide published in Mexico during that time to invite uh, or to sell a kind of vacation package to elite Mexicans to go to the World's Fair in 1893. Um, I guess so. My question to you all is what. What kind of influence did the, did the 1893 World's Fair have on uh, the Diaz regime and, and, in, and in commemorating, of course, um, uh, independence, uh, given that, you know, the, the, the World's Fair in Chicago is also commemorating, right, like the discovery of America, uh, although, you know, they're, they're, of course, they're behind by a year because they're, they're so busy building stuff. And then a second kind of 
part of my question to that is, both of you talked about the kind of importance and the symbolism of that of that um, that centennial, but what about the kind of like material consequences of celebrating such a big affair that brings so many bodies to a space? You know, the World's Fair helps uh, re-urbanize Chicago in many ways that that shapes it to the to the to the to the kind of geography that we see today. So I guess I'm curious as to what kind of urbanizing effects the 1910 centennial has on uh, that part of Mexico. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thanks. Mauricio, go ahead. Ah, um, well, um, um, Yes, uh, World's Fair in 1851, uh, the Crystal Palace in London became a way to celebrate. And the model was 1889, uh, 1876, uh, the celebration of Centennial Independence in Philadelphia uh, with the uh, International Fairs and then the celebration of uh, July 14, the Centennial of the French Revolution in Paris in 1889 with the Eiffel Tower and the whole thing. Um, Mexico was not very uh, relevant in the 1876. Uh, uh, the great uh, guest in that uh, in the world uh, of that um, fair was the Emperor Don Pedro II of Brazil, because uh, not only he was the chief of state of a very stable and big country who had won the Paraguayan War, but also had been the, interme the, the intermediary in the in some uh, disputes which were exemplary at the moment because it, it was a way to gain peace with England and after the American Civil War uh, because the, the, the Union had accused the, the British uh, of supporting the Confederates uh, in constructing uh, uh, ships uh, and there was a huge dispute and the Emperor served as intermediary and rule in favor of the United States. So Don Pedro was in, in, in 76. But um, uh, to be uh, brief, um, the Mexican, uh, uh, the, the, the model was Paris for Chicago too. Uh, and Mexico was very important and the consequences of this fair is very important for many circumstances. But Mexico had not a very significant presence there because Mexico was attending in 1892 very important historical international fair in Madrid celebrating Columbus. Um, uh, but to be very simple, it's not only elites, Mexican elites. It's funny that uh, you mentioned 1893 because there uh, some journalists, Mexican journalists who were covering the fair run into the streets with uh, Nuno, the Catalan uh, musician who composed the Mexican anthem, who was living in poverty in Chicago. But what I can tell you is that what very successful in Chicago was, uh, to go back to my idea that this is very Porfirian, uh, during the Porfirio, there were very famous uh, orquestas típicas mexicanas. And one of the most famous orquesta típica mexicana played in, in Chicago and was a great success. Um, and, um, and was very important, uh, but it was not a very significant fair 1893, although it, it looks big and everything, uh, it was much more important Paris 1889 and Paris 1900, uh, who had visitors of 50 million people. And there Mexico was very present. Uh, now what effects, I, I mean, there was, as I, as I have somewhere explained, there were many attempts to, to, to as, as Brazil did for the centennial of Mexican uh, of Brazilian independence, to organize an international fair. But in Mexico never worked. There were many attempts. But as I have shown somewhere, the the centennial, who, as Manuel said, were uh, was in the making since 1906, uh, was a whole re, uh, uh, reshaping of the city, and basically uh, the the civic uh, and the uh, uh, segregated space of the city was uh, really reinforced during the centennial. And if the access of the country was for a long time and still is this uh, Paseo de la Reforma and the history is told there, it's, it's a Porfirian plan. 
uh, that was planned for the centennial. And the whole axis is there. The monuments were moved, El Caballito, uh, 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 Columbus, uh, the, the, in, uh, the, the monument to independence. And, uh, and the axis was going to go all the way to the Parlamento, which was in the making, and the Opera House, which was in the making. So basically, the face of modern Mexico uh, and the entire, uh, sh as, as you know, Chicago, uh, Washington was uh, uh, planned and the whole thing in 1800 by Lefant. But in fact, it was not finished until almost 1920s. And what did it market? The mall. So uh, the mall, which was created, yes, planned by Lefant, but then with the uh, monument to Lincoln in 1922 and the obelisk and the whole thing and the grand monument, the whole thing collapsed. Well, for Mexico, that was done in El Paseo de la Reforma and created an entire uh, uh, conception of what was going to be the ideal city. It was done during the centennial, planned during the centennial. Of course, uh, uh, it was not possible to control, but for a long time it worked. And even after the revolution, what did the revolutionary government, uh, the revolutionary lead this? Just expand the, the, the Profidian project. Instead of finishing in Chapultepec, they went to Las Lomas de Chapultepec. And then they were to ops, so they continued the same uh, uh, path until the city became unmanageable and then it's a mess. But, uh, but yes, he, the centennial was vital for the transformation of the city. Just to add very quickly, Mike, to that, I think obviously this, the participation of Mexico at the World's Fair, as Mauricio has just mentioned in the study, it was just the staging of the idea of, of, of Mexico, sort of rehearsing it abroad, right? And um, I think that um, one of the things that uh, did we lose Marius? Yeah. Uh, he mentioned quickly the 19, I'm sorry, 1889, sort of like, you know, Parisian uh, universal exposition and Mexico, you know, inaugurated at Teocali as the pavilion. And that, I think you could see there in terms of, you know, almost the materialization of, you know, the place of the glorious indigenous past. And it just quickly, in terms of the 1910 celebrations, besides, you know, um, El Paseo de la Reforma, uh, let us not forget two iconic monuments were erected, one of them being obviously El Angel de la Independencia, that summons people and, you know, in, in so many ways it, um, it, be, it becomes like the symbol of the city and El Hemiciclo a Juarez, sort of uh, inserting Diaz as part of this sort of trajectory as almost as a as the heir or the you know of of Juarismo and liberalismo as part of that. Um, and I think that one thing to consider is like how do bodies in movement, all these masses, change the city or experience the city, right? Around these monuments. I never really actually thought until this moment about the Paseo de la Reforma as a kind of historical parade, right? Like, yes. except that it's not moving, you're moving through it. You're moving through it. And you're being, <sighs> that's that's fascinating. I mean, so many fascinating things about the Paseo de la Reforma, but I did, I just never sort of thought, oh, this is very, this was designed purposefully in this way to be didactic. Yes. In the same way that, you know, 20 years later, the muralists would be trying to find a way to teach people a particular vision of Mexican history. And, and think about the debates right now ongoing about the removal of the Cristobal Colon statue, right? And then Tlali, I mean, like the, the sculpture of like that, of almost like all made like statue, right? Representing the earth, Tlali, but- And the generic the symbol of a woman again. Yes. Right, yeah, that's very interesting. That history. Yeah, and also, right. and then also, uh, plan, like disrupting or I don't know altering that historical memory or disrupting that historical memory I mean and that's so fascinating I talked to my students about this especially in the fall about Columbus Day and the statues and how that debate over Columbus is really a hemispheric one that's happening you know everywhere and we think maybe we maybe we think we're just fighting about it here in the United States if we're from the United States but there's an active you know and 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 very um vital debate happening about it in Mexico as well. So historical memory is something that uh, people are still fighting about. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's not really historical, right? It has to do with the present moment. It reflects our values at the time. Right, Yeah. right. Do we, oh, wow. Okay, do we have time for uh, another question or two? Okay, I saw your hand first. So. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, 
one very, very important fact from our independence that I don't think we celebrate enough is that from the beginning in Sentimientos de la Nación, we have clear that we're gonna abolish slavery. We had a clear path in that. I'm an attorney who studied in Mexico City. And when I was studying law, we went through all of these documents. And why is it that we do not give enough importance to this very important fact in Mexican history? And the other question I had about it to read, I, I, I've also noticed through growing up Mexican, when did this erasing of this very important historical figure start? Where did this come from? Do we know? Um, and also knowing that Mexican public uh, education comes from, from the government directly and it's national. So it is all the country learns or does not learn history yes. depending on what's happening coming directly from the government. So those two questions, thank you. Uh, 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 you are right, but uh, as, it, as it turns out, the first years of celebration in the first decade uh, from the after 1921, after 1821, or up to the middle of the 40s, maybe, 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 maybe before, not so. And what part of the celebrations included. Uh, um, that uh, independence abolished slavery. Uh, and that was an important part in the first 10 years of the celebration. Then it was lost. Uh, uh, it became something partly because it was very important at the moment, but then gradually was lost because, you know, um, uh, the debates, the, the instability of the Mexican government, the debates so strong about Catholicism or not Catholicism, monarchy or non monarchy became a, a little bit uh, more uh, um, demanding. But also because remember, by the 1840s, uh, uh, the Mexican government uh, is allowing slavery to exist in Texas in order to save Texas, or at least to... Uh, so you have a weird relationship, you, you cannot think. But uh, you are right, uh, it is amazing because we always use all these, uh, all these uh, caudillos and all these people have the model of the United States, both as July 4th and the constitution and the whole thing. But if you think that the two more successful independents in the continent, which is um, um, the United States and, um, well, one, uh, two of the three more successful in terms of peace and stability, uh, well, or growth, uh, which is Canada, the United States and Brazil, uh, two of them are uh, uh, slavery economies uh, for a long time. Um, it was interesting that Mexico from the beginning together with some uh, places, Always the model, uh, uh, the, for, the, 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 the sad thing is that our commemoration of the 16 is very much based in the documents of a trial, the trial against Al 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 Aldama um, uh, Hidalgo, uh, in which they are both trying to say what they did and trying to save themselves. So you never know what they are saying, but the, the idea that um, Venezuela was always present and they were always talking about Venezuela because it was another revolt and everything. But you know, in Peru and other places, slavery took a long time to be, it was not immediately uh, abolished. So Mexico was an, a, a very interesting example. And you are right, I don't know why we now not talk about, well, whatever it was, it came with the end of slavery. Uh, um, and people celebrated that in the beginning. Now, Iturbide was erased definitely of the national pantheon after the 1850s, before, People still, if there was a conservative government and while Alaman was a, a, alive, Al Alaman in his book said that I, 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 Hidalgo is an outlaw and the real hero of the nation is, is Iturbide. And so he went in and out, but after the liberals final triumph, uh, he was completely erased from the national anthem, erased from all documents, erased from everything. Um, and, and it remained like that. However, even at the last, uh, even at the moment of the 1910 celebration, the sort of Catholic tradition and the sort of uh, uh, sort of conservative local traditions, when people were asked, people will write from the province, oh, what about if we return to the original 
a stanza of the of the of the national anthem, which includes it to read. So people still had a memory. For instance, we today talk about Juarez as if he were as such a consensual hero. It's not consensual. Uh, uh, Juarez has a lot of enemies in Mexico. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, despite the, the, the efforts of the national uh, government, of the Porfirio Diaz government, and then of the revolutionary government to make it into a hero, it is a hero, but it's not an uncontested hero um, uh, because of the, of the relation with the church, because of his anti-Jacobine, uh, anti-clerical positions, because also his laws, Las Leyes de Desamortización, not only appropriated uh, land from the church, but also land from the Indian towns. And so uh, what is this not an uncontested character? Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, he's been uh, uh, maintained as a hero. Iturbide is a very contested, but we never, Diaz is a very, con uh, a very contested and Santana are very contested. The three of them are very, very important. If you think of Santana, guy, not that imposed himself like Franco in Spain. This guy was being, uh, uh, people went to look for him in Manga de Clavo and ask him to come back time and time and time again. So what is in a country that needs Santana? That is the question. And second, uh, Iturbide is the father of the nation. And Diaz, you know, is a bad guy, but you know, it's so important for the history of the nation. So it's, it's interesting that the three billions of our history are very, very important. I, I have to say something really quickly about Iturbide. Uh, well, I study the Cristeros and and uh, their and the subsequent movements on the religious right in Mexico and the U.S. And so for them. Um, they wanted to bring back, I mean, I study one group that launched a revolt f f that was the Movimiento Trigarante. Like they wanted to bring back Iturbide and his Plan de, de Iguala, um, and they were very anti Juarez. So that religious element is really important to understand. Um, and then I just have to put in a plug because we're here in DC for um, the Catholic University, where I'm, I'm a professor at the Catholic University of America. And in our archives, we actually have a copy of the Plan de, de Iguala, um, that was given by the grandson of Iturbide, who ended up living in DC. He has Georgetown, Georgetown connections and Catholic University connections. And so please come up to our archives if you would like to see it. It is open for consult. And if you would like to, we, we have had uh, many interesting visitors come, including some who are Mexican and really um, consider Iturbide to be the proper hero of Mexican independence. So I'm sorry, I just, I had to, <laughs> I had to put that plug in. Uh, I just wanted to add yeah. quickly two things. And I think this is this goes again to the, the, the discussion of what we have in these three past days about historical memory, right? For for instance, for the junta, uh, at, right at the beginning between 1825 and 1829, they will fundraise to sort of free slaves, right? As part, you know, just to showcase how important that, that was. And think about um, the, the presence of, uh, of our descendants now that we always think about Guerrero and we celebrate them as Afro-Mexicano, Morelos too, but you know, this was not the case. And the chronicle of the 1910 celebrations, Genaro Garcia, you know, he he praised Morelos as the epitome of, mes of mestizo, right? I mean, like, and even when they exhumed the, the human remains of, um, of Guerrero for the bicentennial in 2010, they still described them as mestizo, right? But now uh, the discourse about that is changing. Um, how is it that we, we think of them as part of a, Afro-Mexican history, right? And it, it goes with the, with the whole discussions we'll be having about the inclusion of, I mean, like how many Afro-Mexicans there are and uh, sort of rewriting that history, thinking about actors that way or from that perspective. We have five minutes. Perhaps we could, I know we had a couple other hands up. Maybe we could collect a couple questions and then answer in a concluding statement, a short concluding statement from each of you. So do we have a couple more questions? Or maybe people had their, oh no, okay. Uh, I see a hand back there. I was gonna say maybe we answered all the questions with our long answers, but. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Uh, my question has always, uh, or like my, one of the things I was thinking as you mentioned the figure of the woman, that is sort of like their the mythicized figure. I also think that there is another sort of like figures that are there, but in a very mythical way, because they're not really quite there. And this, this is something that Professor Hoya was saying that like people don't have the language for them. It's a diversity that is uh, uh, outside of the, the metropolis of Mexico. 
But I feel like oftentimes the way we think about even like today, the conversation was centered on Mexico City, like what's happening on this, the, the uh, anniversary, like the uh, how the celebration is happening in Mexico City and now outside of the periphery, or like outside in the periphery. Yeah. So in a sense, I feel like the periphery is there, but it's not really quite there. And it's not really almost like celebrated because even today, like for example, in, in the south of Mexico, they had this big Tepali that is basically a, uh, a Mexica centric celebration of indigeneity. Uh -huh. It doesn't really encompass all broader indigeneity, like the broader diversity that is actually within Mexico. So I was actually wondering, in a sense, has it always been that case beyond the fact that it is a very, like Mexico and the institution of Mexico center on Mexico City, has it always been that the celebration has more or less this, the periphery has to emulate the, mm. the capital or mm. has it been diversity within the periphery that kind of like is different from the, the capital? Thank you. Do, do we have another question or two, or we can just go to that one? But to me, yes. Thank you so much for your time. And as an alum of Catholic University <laughs> Law School, thank you for the plug. <laughs> uh, I, my wife uh, was born, raised, educated in Mexico City. Uh, we dated long distance when we were in law school. So I tell people we had a DC, ADFA relationship. <laughs> Uh, and I've traveled to Mexico many times over the past decade. One of my favorite things I love to tell my friends is I can celebrate two Independence Days now. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part of Mexico's Independence Day is the Grito. Mm -hmm. And I love it because it has helped me over the years to learn about Mexico's founders. Viva Hidalgo, Viva Jimenez, Viva Morelos. I believe since President Enrique Peña Nieto was the first time that I heard Viva Josefina Ortiz de Dominguez. Mm. And I was able to turn to my wife and say, who, who is that? And she explained to me, and I was so proud to tell my American friends, they really honor the founding mothers of Mexico far better than we do here. We don't really acknowledge Abigail Adams. We should. And that is one thing that I love telling my friends about Mexico. So my question is, where does that aspect of celebrating Mexico's Independence Day, where does that come from, the Grito? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands. So perhaps each of you in just our last couple minutes could talk about this. We have the question of the core and the peri per periphery, and then we have the question about, um, about the Grito and the origins of the, of the Grito. Thank you. I'll just say very quickly as someone who, you know, is from Northern Mexico and they live in California. Um, I was always very envious and upset about the, how Mexico is such a centralized state, right? And how we don't get access to these differentiated access to these celebrations um, that I went to experience in, in other parts of the Republic. And I was always very, very curious as to why um, certain things were sort of exalted over others. Um, but definitely, you know, in the 1800s, it was just about creating an illusion, an idea of the nation. I mean, everything was such a big chaos, right? And I imagine after Mexico lost its half of its territory, you know, what the, you know, have to think about what the nation was. Um, and I think that because, you know, the poll, I mean, like, yes, at the end of the day, it's because Mexico is such a centralized place. But this is not to say that uh, people in the provinces adopted an imagined version of that Mexicanidad, right? Uh, and I think that's that's very interesting. We need to, we need more historians, we need more culture study scholars to look at the archives, the local archives, and see how you know each community appropriated that imagined version, that imagined um, version of of lo mexicano. Uh, so thank you for your question. Um, and yes, I think, uh, you know, celebrating independence is just, again, sort of affirming that difference. And, and as Mauricio suggested, you know, it, it, it also, it was very important to sort of um, declare that autonomy and at the same time emulate other nations that had done the same, right? Um, and one of the things that we need to also consider is even that gendered language, since they're suggesting, you know, the participation of women, but uh, throughout this talk, we'll be talking about the motherland, for instance, right? La Madre Patria and the sister nations, etc. So um, 
there's many more things that we still need to interrogate as to how the meaning of the independence has evolved and changed. And yes, I mean, we didn't get to talk about indigenous people and more for descendants and, but- we could stay for another few hours. I yes. <laughs> Mauricio, would you like the punto final? Yes, uh, well, it, 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 it's right. Um, you know, the centralization of these things were always very slow. So during the Porfiriato it started with the liberal historiography, the centralization of the pre-Hispanic past always as the Aztecs, always as the Mexicas, which then becomes very much part of the national, uh, el, el, el nacionalismo revolucionario that was in the textbooks all over the, the pre-government. And it's today there, as you notice, uh, uh, is, is our past is the Indian past, which is the Aztecas. We come from the Aztecas and we all always talking in this way. But for a while it was difficult to centralize because um, you know, in Yucatan, people celebrated yes, more or less the same script, but uh, even the architecture and the thing, a very famous architecture that copied the Maya styles, Amabilis did lots of work there. So in the same revolutionary fashion, but with a local accent and gradually it was becoming, but my impression, is that after the invention of the radio and then the movies and the whole thing, uh, and then the public education, it became harder and harder to have. And then uh, it was obvious that all the experiments that were taking place during the Porfiriato and the first years after the revolution became very centralized. And then uh, the Aztec, uh, we are all Aztec. Think even today, uh, the changing of the Arbol de la Noche Triste a la Arbol de la Noche Victoriosa is to think that, uh, uh, um, the winners were the Mexicas, so uh, the Tascatecas, the, the Coscocanos are not welcome, uh, be, but they were the ones who made the Mexicas cry or cry with uh, Cortes uh, because they were alive with Cortes. So it's very centralized in Mexica, Mexica, Mexica. Uh, but in the same way that all those experiments that the Porfirio Diaz as in the celebration of 1921 and if, then after became Mexico became Jalisco, that is, the Mexican folklore uh, now as, uh, as uh, uh, you know, Flamenco and Andalusia is Spain, Jalisco charros y, 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 y pistolas y rancheras y, y jarabe tapatio is Mexico uh, uh, against other things and became very centralized. Uh, but that was a process more of the 19th century. Now, um, I think that the Grito comes from a tradition that becomes very important after the uh, French Revolution. After the French Revolution, uh, the Grito becomes a gendra agenda in the same way that a manifesto becomes a agenda in the 20th century. You are going a moment, you have to write a manifesto, el manifesto comunista, uh, you know, surrealist manifesto, you have to write, and el grito becomes a agenda. Whether it happened or not, you need it in the way to start a huge movement all of the sudden. There is the grito de piranga, you know, uh, uh, Brazil independence didn't even have a, a war or anything. It was a grito, and it was a simple grito, fico, I stay. Uh, whether it happened in, 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 I don't know, but it's a grito and there is a, uh, in Spain, there are many gritos uh, that starts revolutions and everything. So it's a gender that becomes like a, like a flag. You need a flag, you need an emblem, you need a manifesto, you need a, a, a plan, un pacto. And so the, the, the grito becomes a gender. Uh, in Mexico, they put the bell and they put the it was at night and they put the whole thing to make the grito more but it's just a literal gender. Uh, whether it happened or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the Brazilian one is also a grito, the grito of this, grito, uh, there are too many gritos. Uh, um, but it became very important uh, during Porfirian to stage the whole thing as a popular party in the Zocalo with the bell and the grito. And then every president has the right to, to the gritar uh, uh, every year uh, and became very, uh, you know, it's, it's an old tradition. It's like, a, like a, it's, it's, it's an old thing that still survives, but it was a, a, a literary gender. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you to the audience for your wonderful questions. And we'll conclude this panel with, uh, we'll turn it over to you and thank you, conclude uh, the event. Thank you to all, to all three of you today. It was wonderful. Um, and well, um, KC Lurch will be connecting because we'll just be saying thank you because today is the end, at least for the in-person uh, series of Age of Revolutions. Uh, Monday, we're gonna have the full virtual event of conferences run by the Instituto Investigaciones Históricas. Um, 
Dr. Elisa Speckman has been very, um, very helpful in putting all of this together. Casey's with us right now. Um, so please, please connect. Um, we would love uh, your comments and questions. Um, Casey, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Yes, thank you so much, Marcel. Um, and thank you to our wonderful presenters today. I wanted to just issue kind of a, a big general thank you to everybody who's been involved in putting on this event in this complicated way from a multitude of locations and countries and, uh, and places near and far DC, especially to the folks at the Mexican Cultural Institute, Ixnik and Beatriz and Pilar and Enrique, and particularly to Marcel, who's been kind of a part of this from the outset and invited me and all of us at Hopkins to take part. So I, I really wanted to pass on our thanks from here, as well as thanks to the folks at Johns Hopkins, the staff at the International Centers and Programs, who've taken care of some of the logistics from our side, and our colleagues at the Instituto de Investigaciones Históricas at UNAM, who are putting on this conference on Monday with the, with the younger scholars who are doing really innovative work on the independence era and that we encourage you all um, to take part in. It's, it's entirely virtual and, and you can find information about it at the Mexican Cultural Institute's website. Um, and it should be a wonderful kind of day of, of presentations and um, academic papers and, and kind of new thoughts on, on where independence is going. Um, just to quickly wrap up, I know some folks are still here, some folks are, are tuning in virtually from, who have participated over the last three days. So thank you again to Marcela Echeverri, Jordana Dim, Alfredo Avila, Erika Pani, Caitlin Fitz, our presenters today, Manuel Cuellar, Mauricio Tenorio Trillo, and, and Julia Young. Um, and also to our, our performers, El Grupo Fénix, who got to be the first people to perform in person again at the Mexican Cultural Institute to play music in that wonderful space um, since the beginning of the pandemic. And, and now uh, those of you who are there in person and those tuning in online will get to see this wonderful Danza Folklorica, Baile Folklorica coming up. And if you're there in person, enjoy some refreshments as well. Um, so this has been really just a wonderful set of conversations that remind us that independence celebrations are always changing, especially today's conversation and they're always evolving and that we now get to kind of take part in creating what we want out of independence and the commemorations of it. Um, it's also a reminder that independence and its celebrations have always really been about more than just the nation, which has been a really refreshing set of this conversation to me, um, that putting it in hemispheric perspectives is not something we're forcing onto uh, the celebration of independence, but has been there from the outset as kind of the ways in which these juntas patrióticas talked about Mexico, but also talked about America or the Americas um, from the outset, that independence was being celebrated in the United States, in um, Gran Colombia, in all sorts of parts of Latin America, kind of in reference to each other. Um, and so the conversations that we've been having, putting scholars of different places in conversation, in, in dialogue, make a lot of sense, would make sense to the people who we're talking about um, as well. And that kind of the conversations we've been having about you know, how to think about independence beyond the heroes who are painted on the walls and if with the named heroes who are painted on the walls of the Institute has also been really refreshing and thinking about the many meanings of freedom, freedom and autonomy that are part of, um, of independence and its celebrations, uh, both in Mexico and kind of throughout the, the Americas. Um, and for those of you who are lucky enough to be at the Instituto and have these wonderful murals around you, I do think, as Julia kept referring to them, like they are such, they capture a lot of what this set of conversations has been about, about kind of moving again past this set of heroes um, to incorporate a lot of other people, even if many of the people on the walls are of the, the, the types that Professor Cuellar was referring to, you still do get to see faces of more than just Bolivar, more than just Morelos and Hidalgo, and what is there on the walls, and Lincoln, of course, too, and Washington. Um, but that there's there's kind of some specificity to the people who are being depicted. And for those who are, have been tuning in virtually, I encourage you to go to the MCI, to the Instituto's website and see the, the photographs of these wonderful murals that we've referred to so many times um, that have just been recently restored and are, are worth a visit if you can make it in person, um, but look at them online if, if you can't. 
Um, and so with that, I, I want to wrap up and hand things back over to Marcel and, and wish all of those of you who are in person um, kind of an enjoyable performance coming up and the, the refreshments on Friday were wonderful and I'm sure they will be today as well. So <laughs> enjoy uh, whatever it is we have on offer and, and the dancing and to those of you turning in virtually, um, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and know that kind of these presentations will be, um, as far as I understood it, made available kind of for use in your classroom for kind of handing on to friends who weren't able to make it and are still inter interested. Um, recordings of these will be will, will be available via the, the Cultural Institute. So reach out if you're interested in passing this along. So thank you again, everybody for taking part and attending. And Marcel, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, I wanted to thank you, Casey. I wanted to add one last thing. Putting together this event, uh, this as you've seen, it's been a hybrid format that we've been experimenting with. And then cultural events has been like a titanic <laughs> moment. And I would like to thank all the staff, um, Luis Samuel for the virtual side and Jose Corsa. They've all, all, all been very helpful and, and they've been here the last four days, like putting together and trying to see how it works. And then for the cultural events, um, I would like to uh, say thank you to all the performers, to, to Corazón Folclorico, Grupo Fénix, and to Enrique Quiroz, who put all the events throughout the three days. And no less, very important, the Mexican cultural team, which has been wonderful. Ixnik, the executive director, Beatriz, the acting director but also Billy, especially, she did a lot of work throughout the whole time since March, trying to invite and like all, everything. Um, Monica, Luis, uh, Nazario, and, um, and Angel. Um, thank you to all of you and thank you so much and please enjoy and come to the cultural event that's gonna be next door.